from Los Angeles, California. Welcome to CG Society. I'm your host, Travis Bourbeau, and today we're joined by Ian Spriggs, who is a CG portrait artist and uh, character artist working in the industry. Um, Ian, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad to have you today. Um, so you have a really interesting story. I, I really love your site here. Your site is great. Uh, but you have a really interesting story in the sense of where you got started. And I thought that that would be a great place for us to jump off. Um, and that is this show. <laughs> um, so can you tell yeah, everybody you how, how you got started in the industry? This is Veggie Tales, And this was your first job out of school. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Oh, so uh, so long ago. It feels like a different lifetime. Yeah, I was straight up school in uh, 2006. Yeah. So I went to a uh, Seneca school. I was actually I'll just tell you a little bit of history of like how I got into the, the industry. Sure. So I was in Montreal. I was actually jobless. I didn't have any like I had a uh, degree in fine arts. I couldn't get a job with it. So my younger brother suggested that I just go to like animation school, and then it just kind of clicked. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I have to do. So I went to, I moved that week to Toronto to go to school at Seneca. Absolutely loved 3D and just started just doing as much 3D as I could. And then right out of school, I got a job at Stars uh, working on Veggie Tales. Just modeling some backgrounds and props and stuff like that. There's a lot of amazing talent that came out of that studio, though. And and it's it's funny because you know, you look at VeggieTales, it's a super successful hit, right? But, um, you yeah. know, there's a few artists over at Pixar I know doing lighting that are just brilliant and amazing. And I'm like, where'd you get your start? And they're like, oh, I worked on VeggieTales for a few years. <laughs> and, you know, now <laughs> we go, we, we have you on today and you go from VeggieTales to this. You know, how does your portfolio, <laughs> what, kind of work, what kind of work do you put out there to change? Or, you know, how, how do you go from there to this, I guess, is, is the question. Oh, uh, that's a good. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I started doing some of the characters in the Veggie Tales, and then uh, I kind of like realized that like cartoon animation wasn't really my style. Like because I have a art history background, like going to art school and stuff, I really was always drawn to the Renaissance and the Baroque period. And so it was like it took me a few years to realize that's what I want to do. So I throughout my career, I started getting more into characters and. Just kept on pushing that, and then I was, it wasn't until like 2014 where I was like, you know what, I absolutely love the work by Rembrandt and that period. I'm actually just going to create a, a self-portrait in the style kind of like that. Like I've always wanted to do it, but I've never actually done it, so I just kind of forced myself to do it. And that's where my self-portrait came from. And is that this one, or is this one done later in your, your career? I'm, I'm assuming that's this is more recent. Very, <laughs> that, that's my very first uh, portrait. Is it really? Well, that's that's yeah, harsh. If you're watching today, this is not what we expect of you for your first portrait. <laughs> well, I, I've obviously done characters before, but there's a difference between character art and portrait art. And and what would you say that big difference is? Like a uh, character art is kind of like uh, it's used for like films and like you can just like it's a P6. It's like a online avatar or digital avatar. A portrait you're really trying to like use. It's kind of like a a painting, you're using like every tool, like lighting, composition, you're trying to express who a individual is, like who they are as a human being rather than just a character which they can use for like some explosions in some movies. And you said that your education in art, is it, um, is it the individual that, that draws you to portraiture? Is it the lighting? Is it the combination of these things with your art history? What would you say the thing that draws you to this type of work the most is? Is it capturing realism? Uh, to begin with, it was just like, I like that art history. I, I never really understood why, but the more portraits I do, the more I'm beginning to realize it's more about, uh, it's, it's about asking the bigger questions of like, what makes us human? Right. So it's like, as I do portraits, it's kind of, like I'm trying to figure out who they are, not just representationally, but just like emotionally too. So that's what I'm trying to explain. And the more, the deeper I go into that, it's like the deeper I want to go into my artwork. And it's kind of like a snowball effect. It's like the more I want to know about who, who people are and what makes them tick and all that yeah. stuff. Well, you can tell you, you can tell you care about the people. It seems like you're choosing people that you're familiar with too. It doesn't seem like you're grabbing a random model because of the way they look, but rather 
it seems like. I, I know this guy you said is a, is a close friend, um, but it seems to be that everybody in your portrait is, you know, has some sort of meaning beyond just being a model. Um, and, you know, maybe that's helping with the impact of getting the expression or look on a face, because as you said, you're looking deeper into them. Does that have any impact on the work at all? Or is that just by chance that oh, yeah. you're forcing family members and friends to jump into jump into it to sit still? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a bit of both, but yeah, it's like every portrait I do, it's somebody I've, I know. Right. So I, I very rarely would ever, like, I'd never want to do a portrait of somebody I've never met. Like, if I ever got a commission, I'd really want to meet the person and get to know them as a, as a, because there's like personality is what really defines us. Like I think representationally, it doesn't like we can be anybody really. It's just like it's our insides which make us who we are. So it's like right. knowing people it makes it personal as well. And personal works obviously should be personal. It's like you should do stuff you love, so you do stuff in your life which you care about. So how, how does how does one of these portraits begin? I think. You know, this one's probably an interesting one to talk about, not just because of the the character that's in the picture, um, but you and I had talked before about um, something I, I was unaware of is hands, hands in a in a you know traditionally hands in a traditional oil painting shows that you know the person commissioning it has wealth. So I think it's better left to let you tell the story side of that, but tell us a little bit about the hands, and then also just how do how do you go about you know starting one of these images? Does it start with a photo shoot? You know, do you jump straight into it? Do you start to model first? Um, do you want to lay out that pipeline or? Uh, sure, sure. I'll talk a little bit about the hands quickly and then we, I can tell you about the workflow if you want. Sure. So for this portrait, uh, I've since Neil, like, this is Neil Blomkamp. He's, I, personally, I think he's one of the top directors in the, in the industry. So I wanted to have both of his hands front and present because in Renaissance paintings, if you have two hands present, that means you're kind of like a, of a wealthy status because hands take a long time to paint. So any time you see a portrait of the person's hands in the painting, they're wealthy because they were able to afford it. And because he's a top director, he has to have two hands in, in front. front <laughs> see, not just one, right? <laughs> Both of them. Yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, exactly. that's interesting. Exactly. That's where your art history comes into play, right? I mean, I was unaware of that. I'm self-educated, so I don't have that knowledge. But just just the fact that you know you talk on that, it makes the image that much more interesting now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, was always, I always try to add some sort of uh, connection to the past in some way. Yeah, this is an excellent piece. And so, how does this? How did you start this piece out, or any piece like this? It doesn't necessarily have to be this one specifically. But does this start with a photo shoot? Are you using photography, or are you just going straight in and doing like a live sketch? What's what's your uh, process? So so for this one in particular, I uh, there was a room I, at Oat Studio. There was this like dark room with a window coming through, like on the like right hand side of right screen. There's like a window coming through, and I was like, Neil, this is a perfect space for to, to do a photo shoot. So I'll I'll get him to sit down, do multiple different poses. I try like different like uh, move the chair around, and I'll just take like like a hundred photographs of just different ideas. Once I've got something I kind of like, which I can, which kind of represents his personality, I'll do like a. It's almost like I don't use scans, but it's basically my process is like that of a scan. I'll take photos of every single angle, right, and then I'll model the the person to all of those photos. So I'll have, have like a hundred photos from every single angle and model from that, and then I'll also have a separate shoot for the the poses and the lighting. Do you do you have any? So the of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. So by the end of it, I have like 200 photos of music. So with that much reference, that's um, it's amazing. Get that much reference. Do you have? Do you feel like you have any weakness? You know, or is it just is it just straight translation? Because you're getting the emotion in the face, and I imagine that that probably is not coming across in the photographs necessarily. You're probably implying some of that. I, I don't know. I'm guessing. But, um, yeah, it's kind of like a fine line. Yeah. Call from Sorry, one, I'm just two, no, that's okay. It makes it cooler. It oh. makes it feel like you're calling from Blade Runner. So, sorry, I was. I got a phone call. You cut out for a moment. Can you, oh. can you repeat the question? Oh no, no problem. Question? I said it just made it made the podcast more interesting. It sounds like you're calling from the movie Blade Runner. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just asking if. Uh, where at this time, you know, you've been doing this for a long time since, since 2006. 
where are the challenges for you, even with reference, where the challenges are, you know, do you find doing heads and faces fairly easy or motion fairly easy? Does cloth or fabric and, you know, modeling out the costume, is, is that the more challenging part? Um, what's the challenge from the technical side, not necessarily the artistic side, but the technical side, um, where, where do you feel that you struggle? Uh, for me, I find the hardest part is like, like there's a fine line between like this the technical and the, the artistic side. So the technical you'd want it to look identical to the photo reference, but then you don't want it to look like just a photograph because it's not there's no art in it. So you want to create a style. So once you create style, you create like imperfections, you create flaws, and it makes it kind of a more beautiful piece. But then once you start doing that, you pull away from the photo realism. Because it's not true to like the representational size, so right. it's a fine line of balancing those two. Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably the hardest part for me so, so far. Because I still want to, I want you to like be able to see my work and be like, oh, that's that's an Ian Spriggs. Like I don't want you to look at my work and be like, oh, that's just a photograph. Right. I want you to see like who I am through my work as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, where are you getting your lighting information from? Is that just years of artistic training and your background from school? Did you pick up, you know, was there any knowledge you picked up when you started doing photography? And I guess the question too is, you know, did you start doing photography at school or did you kind of start photography and portrait 3D at the same time? Uh, I basically just picked up photography in like the last few years. Right. Like it was just from a necessity of needing to do Portraits. I'm actually, I'm pretty terrible at taking photographs. I just try and get like one setting and then I just go from there. Like the photos I take aren't actually that great. Like I'm basically, <laughs> hey, if you can do that, if you, you can film 3D like this well, then that, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Like you can fix anything with 3D basically. Like you add more details. You, the photo can like terrible, but the, the, the 3D portrait can actually turn out pretty good. Yeah, I'm a, I'm amazed at how you're pulling off the hair. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about software near the end of the podcast here. But uh, the fact that you're able to pull off hair the way that you're pulling it off, man, I mean, it, it feels like at some level, like, is he just, wouldn't he just photo bash it in? But uh, you're getting there. How long does a piece like this take? Uh, this one took about uh, three months, but it's kind of like all my spare time outside of the work hours. But I guess if you condense it, maybe a month and a half for this one. Yeah. I kind of cut cut, uh, cut corners, though, because like, I, I don't model the back of the head or the back of this jacket or anything. It's just I model to the shot. Right. And that's the that's way a lot of production is going today, too, as far as you know, conceptual modelers go. It's like if you need to be efficient, right? <laughs> it's like if it doesn't show to the yeah. camera, if the director's not looking at it, don't waste time. Um, this is so cool, though, man. Even the patches and everything on here, like it's it's pretty unbelievable. Um, you, know, you have do you do you want to walk us through? Do you have anything you can show us? I know we talked about maybe opening something up and taking a look. Would you like to show us a little like your process inside some of the software or or how you go about yeah. laying out things? Let's switch over to your screen. Yeah. Right? yeah I, uh, sure. Hold on a second. One second. Uh, All right. So can you, can you see the screen? We can, yeah. OK. Uh, so there we go. Can you see uh, Sean? Yes, I'm looking good. So this is the Maya, the Maya version. This is like what I'm, like this is where I start lighting it, putting everything together, putting the shaders together. Now, are you lighting in Maya, or are you using another app like V-Ray or Arnold or something else? No, I use the uh, V-Ray. I find it's like it's, I don't know, I'm just kind of used to it. V-Ray has been pretty supportive of my work. So they've been, uh, they give me a free license of it and stuff. So they've been really helpful and really bad. Actually, they've actually promoted my work quite a lot. So I'm really grateful to them. But so yeah, V-Ray has been pretty good. So I usually yeah. just light in V-Ray. Now like you're it. just using area lights. Like I, I just recently picked up V-Ray and knew nothing about it. That's how little I know about it. But I just picked it up and started using stencils of like actual studio lights I'm familiar with. So I shoot with a beauty dish and some octagon lights and I understand those. I understand how to use them. Um, and I've placed them in there. Are you using any of those alpha textures or anything on your lights or are you just going with straight light sources or um, what's your approach? To that? Uh, I just basically like 
you can see my settings. It's just like a straight white, <laughs> white light. Okay. It's just, there's nothing in it. It's just a, a crate light. So that's what I'm wondering if I'm overthinking it with grids and beauty dishes. It's just that in real life, if you're photographing and you use a beauty dish, you can put me in front of the camera and it looks good. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, and, and, you know, that I, is a big the, thing, right? Good lighting can make a bad model look pretty, pretty decent if you know what you're doing. I'll say, like, I'm all about simplicity. Most of right. my VRA settings are just like whatever's default. <laughs> As like this, I just create a light. I control the intensity, and all. That's honestly about it. Well, people came in here loving you today, but they might leave hating you. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just go with default, man. I just straight out of box. <laughs> but you're getting the results, you know. That, that says something, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, but yeah, it's like even with like the the shaders, like I try to keep them as simple as possible. Like sometimes, like like I won't even do the gloss map. I was just like, I won't even do a bump map. I can just use sometimes displacement, diffuse, and spec. It's like the simpler it is, the easier it is to make changes. And you just got, I don't know, you just. That's a good point. It's easier to move forward, I guess, and make things yeah. look better. And then how do you go about um, composition? Is the composition worked out at the photographing stage, or is that something that photographing is more just for the translation and you're creating the composition on your own? Uh, so I kind of. I kind of, it's like I, so these are like all the photos I'll take of Sean. Okay. That's so cool. then I was trying, trying to pick some like some kind of idea of what photos I like. But then for Sean, it's like I really like the uh, uh, the Vermeer's gold pearl layering. So I use that uh -huh. as the composition. So I actually measured the, the canvas of this painting and matched it exactly to Sean's. So that's what I used for the composition. Rip it off and make it your own, right? I mean, that's that's <laughs> like the golden rule in production is like, you know, don't be afraid to copy someone, but don't do exactly what they've done, right? Like figure out how to make it your own, like what they're doing is successful and applying it to your own work. And I mean, this is a, a great example of that. That's very cool to see. Yeah. So yeah, like most of my work is like basically, like it's almost like, it's, I get inspired and it's almost copied, but it's kind of very, uh, So you can see it's like it's very different. But you can see like where I get my inspiration from for a lot of my work. Uh, I think I got some more. Interesting. So yeah, I definitely start off with an, like a composition. I, I, get, I find a painting I like from the past and I would create something loosely based on it. So I'll be inspired by it and try and do the photo shoot based on this, this painting. So you're thinking that through before the shoot. It's not happening coincidentally afterwards. You're like you're going in with a plan. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, awesome. I think that's it for the. Yeah, that's it for those references. Gotcha. And any tips on any other tips on composition? Like you know, as far as that eye placement. I, I mean, I think that works pretty good. Is you know, picking picking classical pieces, so to speak, and and going in from it. What do we got here? <laughs> So for composition, like the, the one of Sean, everything was like, uh, the, the importance of Sean is I wanted you to feel like he was the one looking at you and not you looking at him. Okay. So it's like his eye is the most important thing. So everything I did with, with the composition, like the lighting, it made it so everything's being pulled into the eye. So like tips like this, I try and do like do uh, a lot of my work. I've got some other examples of and so do you have for, on, on like eye placement when you know when you're you're setting up to people and, and looking straight at is there is there a guide or are you just eyeballing it as far as how like you direct both eyes to look at the same spot? I try to use like some rules and stuff. So like the golden ratio would help bring into the, the eye. So I use it like the rule of thirds. I, so yeah, basically I try and use what I can, like the, what we know and not like do paintings and stuff, what works and what doesn't. So I try to use the same techniques. But sometimes it's just like, it's just kind of like I make it up as it goes well. Right. Can okay, have some flexibility like, and freedom. This yeah, is exactly. Right on. Well, this, this is this is uh, good stuff. And, you know, as far as your software package, you're using Maya, you're using V-Ray, you're using Mudbox. Um, 
did you just start out with Mudbox? Yeah. And, and that's why you've ended up in it. I, sometimes, you know, when I've talked to people about software, you know, I'm always looking if, you know, they can, they can lay down the strategy of, of why they've chosen the software package they've had. But I have this tendency to, to think that we all just kind of stick with whatever you started with um, <laughs> to, to a large part. So I'm assuming you started with Mudbox and you just stuck with it, or is there anything about it that you feel um, is strategic to your pipeline? Uh, what's good with Mudbox? Like, so if I'm in Maya, so I've got this composition, I got this camera. Right. So I can import that exact same camera to Mudbox. That is cool. And it's the exact same, like, it's the exact same layout as, uh, as Maya's. So I can render in Maya if I want to tweak the ear. I already know exactly where it is on the model. So it's like, there's a, it, they are perfectly in sync with each other. So as I do the workflow, I can make any changes I want to the model or text string, easily pull it back into here, re-render it. And I'm so looking just, I'm looking at your, your palette right there, and I was going to ask about the camera angle, if it imports the same camera angle direct and everything, but it looks like it does, correct? Yeah, exactly. So that's, I think, one of the biggest benefits of Mudbox. It's interesting because that's, I think, one of the biggest questions with ZBrush for a lot of people I work with these days is like, what field of perspective do you use? And people say it doesn't matter, but it's like, well, yeah, no, it, it matters, um, <laughs> you know, and and I'm not sure, I'm not sure why they don't have camera angles, you know, um, in theirs or camera field of view, but this is very cool just because anything that, you know, I'm doing a website redesign, we're doing a website redesign for CT Society right now. And one of the golden rules of design for me is that if it takes three clicks, I want it to take one um, that people yeah. don't, you know, unless you're in this industry, unless you're online or, or working with software doing art in the way that we do it. You know, if you can take something from three or four clicks down to one, you're talking about making more money and saving more money. Uh, and it's just the irritation yeah. of, you know. You do 300 clicks and you can take that down to 150. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's like it, it's, you save so much time. Like just doing a portrait alone, it's like yeah, the amount of clicks you do on a on your mouse is probably like in the like tens of thousands. <laughs> you want to use that by half, you're gonna just work faster, get more. You, it's getting rid of, the, rid of the technical just allows you to be more of an artist. So are you doing any, where are you doing UVs and textures or how's your kind of texturing pipeline goes? Is it shaders? Um, is it a little bit of a mixture? Uh, so my, oh my, I use UV everything in Maya. I usually, I'll build a lower base mesh in here. I'm, I don't actually have it here, but, but I'll UV everything in Maya. And once I've UV'd it, I take it to my box for texturing. And then I can just uh, start, like, I can, Mudbox is good because you can just sculpt and texture at the same time. That's cool. So if like the hoodie is like. Oh, wow, look at that. You can like put everything on this like separate layers here. Oh, my computer, computer's going a little slow. And are, are, these, are these similar production techniques that you're using for the character work you do in film and, and um, in, the, in your traditional day job? Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's the exact same basic workflow. Okay. So, like, I, I usually, usually, like, for production uh, work, I have, like, a pre, uh, pre rated base mesh. So, for work, I'll usually, like, either match it to a scan or start modeling to, based on the photographs and take it to my box and just do the whole process the exact same way. Okay. So, since we're talking about portrait or portfolios and portraits today, this is something that you're building outside of work. And I always say that the most growth for artists happens, you know, outside of production, you know, production, you're kind of following a pipeline. You, you almost get tunnel vision. Like you come up with a methodology, you follow that methodology, you get really good at it, you get really fast at it, you get really efficient at it in order to have time outside the studio. Um, but then the things that you tend to be passionate about more often than not are the things that after you've worked a 10, 12 hour day at the studio, you come home and you sit back down at the computer to do something. Um, this is that thing that you're doing outside of the studio. Um, how does that differ from what you're doing inside the studio and where you want to go with it? You know, this portrait, does this remain a hobby? Does this become a thing that you want to do commissions for? Why jump you know, into this as a passion or is this where you're, you're staying artistic and separating it from the business? 
Well, if you work in nine to five, you work at an industry like a company, you're right. basically being paid to make somebody else's dream come true. Like they wanted to make a movie or they're doing a short. It's like it's their vision. Everything about it's kind of like them, and you're just helping support their dream, which is cool. I think that's pretty awesome to do that. But you can't forget about yourself. Like you want to have your your voice. You want to have be able to express yourself. And I think everybody in some way should always do some sort of art, whether it's music, writing, or dancing, or it's, it's, they need to express themselves somehow. And for me, personal work is the best way for me to express myself. And obviously, I'd love to continue making my personal expressions more of my career. So yeah, like doing commissions and just doing this like full time would be absolutely amazing. Is there a danger if that if that dream comes true? Uh, meaning that somebody comes along and says, "Hey, you know, I've noticed these amazing realistic you know portraits you're doing. We'd love to bring you on full time." Um, is is there a danger to that, or if there is a danger to that, how do they limit it? Do you limit it by saying, "Yeah, I'd love to work with you, but I'm I'm going to do three days a week," or "I'd love to work with you, but it's going to be the portraits I want to do." Um, what are some of the dangers there to to take that thing that you love that you've been working on that you've gotten good at, and then turning that back into a day job? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Because you obviously don't want to uh, like lose your creative freedom. Right. So once you, once people start paying you, it's almost like they have like some strings attached to you in a way. Some it's like they'll kind of pull you. But as long as you, really, it's like as long as you feel as if you've expressed yourself, it doesn't really matter like how it's done. Like if you get paid full time and you actually come home at the end of the day and feel like you've expressed your inner voice, I think that's that's amazing. And it's like you should definitely go for that. It's like some creative fulfillment. Well, mm -hmm. this is really cool. And then you know another thing that's been really interesting is that um, you know you've really been there. What and took over CG Society about two years ago, and it's it's been uh, a pretty strong battle against tech problems. It's a site that's 15 years old and and just been hacked together. But you've been one of the artists that all along has been posting on the site and also just jumping in any time to help, which I wanna say thank you for. I think you've jumped in probably seven, eight times just to give students some free advice and, and just to hold a hand up. So that's really, really cool. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch back over my screen just to take a look at your portfolio real quick. Uh, one, one second. And uh, the reason I want to bring that up is because, you know, we, we are talking about portfolios. And, you know, for those of you that are not familiar with your work, you are working with Oates, you're working with Neil. Um, you're working with a couple of different studios, if I'm not mistaken, on a couple of different projects. And and that work is out there. But primarily, um, you know, we get to take a look at this, right? If you look at your CG Society portfolio, I think that's smart the way that you've kind of organized this into you know, the majority of just your portrait work and by showing like, this is the stuff I love. This is the stuff I want to do. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, are you treating this portfolio any differently, you know, on a regular basis on your website? Are you going to match up what you do at Oats with, you know, what you do in portraits? Um, does that make sense uh, to show somebody like the full body of what you do? Or is it better to have different portfolios at different sites or different portfolios for different purposes? How do you go about the game plan for your career? Uh, that's a good question. It's basically like you're asking exactly like what where I want to go with my career, which I still don't exactly quite know. Like obviously, I think portraiture is definitely something I'd really like to get pushed a little bit more. But like the work I've done for Neil and Notes has been quite amazing. But for me, it's like doing creatures and doing portraits is still two very different things. And it's like right. obviously it's like you you I don't know just like putting feelers out to see what else you enjoy. But I don't know, I think uh, portraiture is definitely my number one uh, focus. Well, that's it's interesting. And I mean, there's there's some artists that come to me and think they're like, oh, CD Society competing against other sites. And like, are you trying to do this or trying to do that? I'm like, no, you should post everywhere. And the key for me telling people to post everywhere is kind of close to what you just said, which is when you post everywhere, you're, you're never missing an unexpected opportunity. Um, and you know, and that's, that's to me, that's why even if you're a successful artist, even if you're the art director on Star Wars, it's still great to put your work out there. Put it on LinkedIn, put it on CG site, put it on ArtStation, put it on PolyCount, wherever it fits. If it's games, put it on PolyCount. If it's not, maybe DeviantArt. But, you know, I think to, to, um, 
avoid doing that and only put your work one place because that's easy is a little bit dangerous in the sense of you're doing what you love. You're creating this portfolio. But if you're not expressing that, if you're not putting that out there for people to find you, because that to me is a component of other people figuring out how to help you. Right. Like you put your work out there. Other people figure out how to get you into a position that pays you to just do portraits. You don't necessarily have to figure that out on your own if you're sharing it along the way. Typically, somebody creative in what they do is going to come along and notice your talent and say, hey, I'd love to work with you. I'd love to do that. Um, is that a part of why you're posting around? Because I do know that you post your art around quite a bit. And I don't think it's because you're needy. Um, <laughs> that you don't need work. You've got work. You're working with Neil Bloomkamp. You're at Oat Studio. You have a successful career. You're clearly talented. Why post everywhere? It's about, it's about being a part of something. It's not just uh, about getting a job or anything like that. It's about, because it's like, as artists, we're, we create art because we want to express ourselves. Right. And then if you can, it, it's because we want to connect with people. We express ourselves because we want to have an outlet. We want to connect. And it's like, if you're posting online, it's the perfect way to connect with people. You're with like-minded people. The, the community is super supportive of everybody. Like, you, I've made some of like, the best friends I have through the community. And it's just like, it's almost become like a family. So it's like, just being posting stuff, you can like share yourself and then other it'll, it'll just make more connections and people will share their work with you. And yeah, it's just a great experience. Really. I, I always feel like, uh, or I always say that I'm looking for fellow travelers, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, part yeah. of that comes down to if you have, I live in LA now, obviously. So everybody here understands what we do. Everybody here kind of does that or, or has a hard time surviving. Um, but if you try to explain this to your mom or your dad, or you try to explain this to your friend from Detroit or <laughs> uh, people outside the industry, you know, when I first started, they're like, so, you know, you work on like Toy Story, right? And I would say, no, no, no. What I do is like more creature design is focus on anime, blah, blah, blah. And I just watched their eyes go blank. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, after the 10th time somebody's asked you that, they're like, you, so you work on like Toy Story because they understand that as being 3D. And I just started saying, yeah, <laughs> right? Like rather than get into it and like define what it is that you do. Uh, I've also gotten myself in trouble um, uh, back when I started a studio in the early 2000s. I remember being in Florida and working remotely with my team that was in Texas. And I'm walking around in front of a shopping center on a phone and I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like this thing needs to be able to shoot through like a 12 foot concrete wall. And it's got to look like that. You know, if it doesn't look like it could blow something up, then like what's the use of paying for it? And I look around and I'm down in like Daytona, Florida, and people are like getting ready to dial like 911. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, I feel abnormal. I feel awkward in, in certain situations. As an artist, you work by yourself so often that like when I get in the crowds, I feel like diving underneath the, the kitchen table. Um, but for yeah, you, exactly. I can't even imagine because you're giving them something that they kind of understand, which is portraiture and, and painting and photography. But you're saying you're doing it in 3D. Uh, and they don't understand it. Really. I imagine I their like face people. melts. They, they say, oh, this is the photograph. That's, what, that's what most of the uh, reactions I get from people outside of the industry. Is it really? Like, like, oh, wow, this is a cool photo. I'm like, well, it's not a photo. And then, like, well, you just projected a photo into a model. That's all you did. I guess oh, it's, it's no. a skin. That's it. Uh, so I'll get people asking commissions, like, can you do a commission of me for, like, 100 bucks or 200 bucks? Oh, man. And it's like, <laughs> you know, it takes a long time. And it's like, I have to explain. That's why I sometimes, like, breakdowns are really good and, like, showing the gray model. It just kind of like helps explain what's behind the curtain. It explains to people who don't really understand it. So yeah, like this one, it kind of helps people understand what it is. It's like it's a clay model. It's like a real sculpture. You just do it digitally. And you're still up in Toronto now, or, or are you in Vancouver? Uh, I was living in Toronto. I was living in Toronto for 10 years, and then I just moved to Vancouver maybe three years ago. Still so actually, you know. Go ahead. As soon as I started my self-portrait, that's as soon as I did my self-portrait, I moved to Vancouver. So my portrait career started in Vancouver, yeah. And your day job now, are you doing oats or what, what what's your day gig doing? Like what type of work are you going back to or escaping? Uh, I'm doing a lot of freelance right now. Okay. So 
Ults is kind of still, we're still trying to figure out what the next steps are moving forward. So we've kind of like, just kind of slowing down a bit, but I still go like, I still have my freelance desk at Oats. So I do some freelance at Oats and freelance at home. But yeah, I'm just basically just doing as much freelance as I can to keep myself busy. And I think um, I think we'll have you guys back and talk about Oats at some point for sure. I think that's a really interesting project. For people that don't know what that project is, you want to just give them a quick breakdown so that they know? Uh, so Oats is just kind of like, it's like a, it's almost like a exper experimental uh, like art house, I guess. Whereas like they want to connect with the audience more so. Like Hollywood's there's like a disconnect of you don't get to choose what you want to see. They right. kind of show you and you pay to see it. Both so we wanted to kind of have more connection with the audience and try and like let the audience dictate what they want to see and then we'll base we will try and make a movie based on that. So we did a whole bunch of shorts and which ones people reacted to the best. The idea was that we were gonna make a feature from the the best short they liked. And it's, it's just like a, I don't know, it's kind of like uh, how a, a music like pitch a musician is with the public. Yeah. Like how a musician has an album. They have like a couple hundred songs maybe throughout their career. Directors only really have like a couple movies. So Neil's right. theory was to have as many shorts as possible. And then you pick the best ones so you can always create that best, the best movie you possibly can. I used to use, um, used Neil's, to use um, Neil's Alive. Neil's Alive. Sorry, got feedback. You probably have to move volume. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Uh, let's see. Yes. Uh, so I used to use Neil's Alive and Joburg, um, short as an example of working with directors. I said, you know, look, if you, if you want to work with a director and you want to know what they really like, about storytelling or, you know, visually from the visual side of storytelling, like what they're interested in, don't watch their big budget films like District 9, go watch Alive and Joburg. If you watch Alive and Joburg, yeah. then you see the tools when they don't have a budget, when they have to make a sacrifice on time, when they only have, you know, an hour to shoot or, you know, one day to get a team together. You know, that's when you really see, to me, the core of, of who a good director is or, or what, what the tools that they're using to direct with because they're going to put those things in there. They're going to fight to get those things in there. They're going to figure it out. And, you know, if the effects aren't good, that's not a big deal. That's not a problem because you can always upgrade effect. But what effects are they using? You know, what what type of, you know, shots are they framing? What's important to them? Is it dialogue? Is it action? Um, and if you watch Alive in Joburg, like all the keys are there. Right. Um, you can really mm -hmm. see like what he's drawn to, at least from an outside perspective. Um, and, and that's been pretty good exactly. to see. I, I, that's, uh, that theory is like basically is like as an artist as well, like what you do at home, what you do in the small, like in your own hours. It's basically right. that defines you woman having been, been paid to do something. And that's something that, you know, listeners here today, we've got a lot of the same guys that have been hanging out. Thanks, guys, for joining us and hanging out. But that's one of the things that these guys have probably grown sick of hearing me say is that it's really important that you have some hobbies outside of just the art. Um, even if, you know, your own art is a part of your hobby, because so many of those hobbies, whether it be music, whether it be sports, whether it be, you know, gambling, whatever it is, is going to have an impact and an influence on the personality that you show in your portfolio. And then it becomes really important to make sure that you are showing those things in your portfolio. Don't just show me academic portfolios. Don't just show me what you did in a class, you know do that, rip it off, make your own, where, you know, do the homework assignment, do the class, but then take that knowledge and apply it to something in your life that matters to you. And if you put that into your portfolio, then I can see some depth and know that like, oh, this guy knows everything there is to know about motocross. That'll be pretty cool because as you know, we're, we're going to have a character that rides a bike in the next piece. So he's going to be able to have a lot of good input in that. Um, do you have any hobbies outside of doing portraiture or is portraiture kind of your hobby? Because that's kind of taking the art and the, the, the hobby and, and blending it together into your own passion. Yeah, I think uh, portrait is my hobby. Uh, yeah, it's got, sometimes I, uh, I've been in, the in front of the computer way too much, but it's right. just like, for me, doing portrait is like, like, I don't know, you go home, you watch a movie, for me it's like, go home, look at my portraiture. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's like I'm addicted to it. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> So I popped up a few images here, and um, 
I'm just kind of cycling through and I, I know that, you know, I don't want to keep this too long for you. I want to make sure that we can get you out of here on time within an hour. And um, so the purpose of the, the, these pro select is to kind of find out a little bit about you, find out about your passion, how you got started in the industry and then how you're using your portfolio. And so it's very cool to be able to step inside and say, okay, here's somebody that is a professional and is successful sharing their portraiture, not necessarily because that's what they're trying to do, you know, but they're putting it out there in that way. And so it's cool to see somebody at your level have a portfolio that's unique for that. And so we're just going through as a portfolio site and popping up images that people have submitted to the gallery and seeing if there's any room for, you know, someone like yourself to come in and say, here's where I would focus on, or maybe this is something that looks like you don't fully understand that you could use a little bit of a hand with and, and help move forward. And I know that reaching back and helping artists up has been an important part of our relationship and, and you being around um, the forums. So that's been very cool. Is there anything, I'm just gonna flip through a few that I've opened and we can go to the main gallery and look for some too. But if you see something that you wanna comment on, then fire away. <laughs> sure. Uh, comment on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrible. Please don't watch. Uh, there we go. And there's a there's a little bit of delay on things, so um, I'll just okay. cycle through and just. There's a lot of good work. It's crazy how much good work is coming out. So okay, let's talk about this guy, the oh. kind of the chubby guy, the org. Yeah, gotcha. Org. That's Adam Scott. Oh, he's uh, he's a phenomenal artist. That this guy. But yeah, I, I really like this guy's work. But for like, for example, this for this is for me is a great piece, but it's more of like a technical study. Right. It's like showing off with a great cool skin shade. Uh, like it looks cool. Everything's kind of cool about it, but it doesn't really express like an emotional side. It's like there's no composition or lighting. It's not like a portrait. It's more just like a character art. So there's a difference between the two. I always right. like to see things and see things lit. I like and uh, the lighting such a powerful tool. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, obviously, the uh, Adam was that was the intention for Adam. He, this is what he wanted to do. But I've seen a lot of uh, character artists who do like they do a lot of T poses. Right. And it just drives me nuts because it's like just pose it, do a simple light on it, and it's going to express so much more, and you're going to connect to it on like an, on a human level a lot more. And, and do you think that a lot of that comes from uh, the length of time that you're working and the burnout that you get in 3D? Meaning that, you know, I see so many pieces that are like 85 percent, 90 percent there. And, and I feel the same way. And again, we're not talking I'm not talking about Adam's piece here, um, but you see somebody who has done a character and the pose just looks like it's an afterthought. Or, you know, everything, the, the face and the wrinkles and the texture to the leather jacket are amazing, but then the belts have like, you know, no history and, and they just look like they were extruded and kind of put on. And it's always difficult to tell if that's a lack of knowledge or just, man, this piece is so good. And they spent so much time on these individual areas that they probably were just ready to move on and be done. Um, how do you distinguish, you know, you personally, when you're looking at character art, how do you distinguish between somebody burning out and just getting tired of model moving on and, and a lack of knowledge um, or, you know, somewhere where they need to, to kind of continue to work. Does that make sense? Um, the way I see it is kind of like, there's a lot of artists who do work from uh, start to finish the, uh, the linear approach. Right. And I feel like once you do that linear approach, you're just going to get tired and you're going to stop and not get to the end result. But you can, the way I try to envision it is like working back from back to front. You, you know your subjects, you know who they are, you're going to present them a certain way. But the way I think of it is like, what, like, I say to myself, what are they thinking? Like, what thought do they have in their head? And at this exact moment in time, that thought, whatever it is, that's what I try to express. And I work backwards from there. So I'll, I'll you're literally photograph it. Yeah, so it's like I'll, I'll pick like the, whatever the photograph is, which I like to pose. I'm like, what, what's, what are they thinking? Everything I do is to express that thought. So it's like I kind of will sometimes jump from the, the beginning straight to the end, and I kind of I go back and forth. It's not like a linear workflow. Right. 
Is, right. Does that kind of make sense a bit? That does. And are, is there ever a time where you're working on more portraits at once or and kind of bouncing back and forth, or do you work on one project all the way through? Uh, sometimes I do a couple portraits at one time. Okay. Uh, is that just to like keep you fresh, or is that just a time frame thing, or is it just you have more ideas and you have time? Uh, it's a bit of more ideas than time, I guess. But I personally like to work on one because I like to immerse myself in it and like really deep down into it. Like if I'm kind of jumping back and forth between projects, I'm I can't really deep into it, uh, dive into it as much. All right. Um, so, so let's take a look at one or two more, and then I'm going to jump back to the questions real quick, and then we'll get you out of here. Um, so if you guys got any questions, if you've got anything that you want to link in the, the, the text chat, go ahead and do that now. Um, this is an old one of Ben Morrow. Ben Morrow is another guy that um, he just does a ton for the community as well, so I just want to give props out to him. I did an event called Animal um, that was raising funds to help save sea lions. It was a lot of fun. A lot of artists came out and helped. And this is one of the portraits that he put in there. And it's kind of cool to see people doing headshots of animals because you don't see that as often. It's a different challenge. Um, yeah, yeah, this is amazing. Really uh, expressive. This is old one of Fosses, I think. Um, now, what about a piece like this? Is there anything you would do, lighting, anything that you would do to this to, to push that, that expression more? Or, or this is a pretty high bar right here. Yeah, this is definitely a pretty high bar. Like he's obviously got a pretty good pose. You, it's kind of like he's offered a story already, which I, I kind of like. Like, you're like right. why is he looking off the distance? He's he's thinking about something like he's kind of rugged clothing, or he's a rugged looking guy. And it's like he's developed a story, which we want to question. So anytime you create a story which is off the page, it's just going to make create more of an interest. And you're going to spend more time looking at the piece and appreciating it. Right. All right, so let me jump over to some questions here as, as we go through. I'm just going to flip through images Why I ask questions. And if you see something you want to comment on, just let me know. Um, how do uh, we build? There's a good question. Uh, uh, go ahead. So there's a question in here. Is, do you direct people's expression in portraits? Ah, good job, Diaz. That's actually a really good question. That's a good question. Uh, because I, uh, I try to. To, to begin with, I try to say, hey, like, let's copy this painting or let's copy this style. Like, I want you to look like this. So I, I'll start telling them to look like this, but it, it never works out. <laughs> what, ha what happens after a while, they start getting relaxed and then the, like, their personality comes out. Once they've got past that camera shy, it's like the true self kind of comes out. And that's when I start capturing a better image of them. And I, I think it's great advice, like going back to what you said, you know, you're, you're basically, you've got it figured out before you start. So you've got a milestone to be able to hit. So whether you're tired of it or not, you've got to get to the point where you finish that image out. And, um, you know, just to add to what you just said, do you go in with the idea of the person's personality, just want to capture a personality? Or do you think there's going to come a point where I want an expression of somebody pissed off? I want an expression of somebody, uh, coming home drunk, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like, you know, do you want to push it with that in, in those directions as well? Or is it really just would, capturing the thought on the mind of that person? I would love to just capture somebody that's like really mad, like really angry, but then right. it's like, it's kind of hard. It's like, you've got to put them in that setting with the nice lighting. Be real. Like, you gotta yeah, for it to be real. <laughs> if I could figure out a way, like at a secret hidden camera and just like piss somebody off, <laughs> let let the manipulation games begin. Um, <laughs> yeah. oh, like this, this, this portrait, I was a fan of like the expression, like the smug look in his face. Oh it's yeah, it's a really great expression. This artist really pulled it off quite well. Like stuff like this, I love. Like it's not just a T pose. It's not just like he's actually. There's really you feel an expression in, in him. He's actually a real person. Well, I, I think that's important too because whether you know whether you're doing character art for games or for film or you're doing just portrait art, if you put a headshot in demo reels these days, it feels a lot like a work in project and a progress unless you you've got something that you're showing it to me for. If it's for blend shapes, totally get it. If it's one headshot to show me how good you are at doing close-ups of heads, that's awesome too. 
But anytime I get into character art portfolios where it's full of, you know, three or four heads and, you know, there's very few characters in there that are posed and you're not showing me that much else, then I'm really afraid of being able to recommend you or bring you onto an art department because, you know, I'm just not sure. But the moment you put a character head into a portfolio like this, you're saying something completely different. And so, you know, you're you're defining the text without having to tell me. Um, and I think that that's really important for people to hear coming up is that, you know, go ahead and do busts. They're a lot of fun. They're great practice. They're great exercise. I love to see you do busts of an arm or bust of a hand, different parts of the body as well. But if you're going to do it and you want the advantage, then, you know, go for the expression. Show me something, um, you know, show me the personality, show me an emotion, um, show me, you know, a, a, a storytelling element. So I think that's a, a good thing to you know, drop in there as well. Absolutely. How do you prepare the reference for your modeling front side three quarter? How many pictures? What about the lighting for the reference picks? Um, is lighting a concern of yours in the reference picks? Uh, you said you pretty much go from it at it from a point of view of um, like scan data. And then a second part of that question is how do you feel doing portraiture art and realism at this level? How do you feel in the next five years with scan data? Um, you compete with that. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen for a second? I can really, I can just show you exactly what my absolutely that would be a lot of fun. Let's switch over now. Uh, give me a second. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so these are the photos I took of Sean. So I'll take front equals. And I'll just take, so it's basically, it's like, that's how a scan works. You just take photos of every single angle. So I'll take a whole bunch of those. These are the ones, these are what I used to model from. And then I just, these are the photos I used for the lighting. So I've tried a whole bunch of different variations of lighting, different tests. And then just like once you feel, starts to feel relaxed, I can get some better photos. So I think I used uh, some of these ones for the actual portrait in the end. But yeah, that's, so it's a couple, like, oh, it's almost 100 photos. That's basically the, my, my processor to begin with. It's better to overshoot than they need something when you don't have it, right? Um, yeah, Brenda's, exactly. Brenda's question, and I don't know that we'll have time for that, but Brenda's question is, um, what what is your creative process for the Zygote film? And uh, in order to answer that, you'd have to let us know what the Zygote film is for the listeners. Um, and is that something you got time to, to talk about? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Thank you, Brenda, for the question. So this is this is the zygote. Uh, yeah, it's basically like this. This uh, alien starts kind of like hacking up humans and starts taking their limbs and attaches it to himself. Uh, so this is the model I built. I started off with like taking some. Uh, scans of people's hands like I use my parents hands for two of the hands and I use some of the others members <laughs> of the hand. No, no, here's what I'm, I'm, I hate to interrupt you, but I've got to interrupt you on that comment because two things. One, this is every modeler's nightmare because it literally is a character full of hands. Um, so, you know, that, that right from the beginning is terrifying. Um, and in the second, you're using your parents as reference. Do you go to them at the end and be like, do you want to see how this turned out? And do they check it out? And what do they think? <laughs> They actually love the being a part of it. So they think it's pretty great. But yeah, they think it's horrific. <laughs> that's that's the point, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, this thing took so long. It took me so long to model it because it's like just getting the silhouette, getting the actual design of the creature. It was like, I got, it was the concept just through the model as well. So like those are a couple of initial concept arts, but we did, we, they were cool, but we didn't, they didn't express what Neo wanted to. So I started concepting while I was modeling it. And then it's like, if they change like one bit, like if they just like, we don't like this arm, that arm is like connected, like it's a chain reaction of multiple arms holding together. So as soon as I would do one thing, it, like the chain reaction throughout the whole body, like everything would change. And, and do, do you get crits like that on this character? Do you literally have someone come in and be like, I don't like that one arm? And, and when they say that, are you just like, <laughs> <laughs> or are you okay with it? Uh, I was pretty lucky. Like I think Neil pretty much lo loved it. Like it took like eight months to model, but it's like he loved it. like every step I showed him. He was like, "I love it. Just keep on going. Just make it cool. Make it cooler." 
So he was pretty pretty cool with it. So it, was like, it wasn't too many revisions. It just took a long time to create. And, and this is one of those things that will reference back to what we were talking about before. How tired of posing hands were you with this? Was there a point where you're just like, ah, I don't care about this one? Or, <laughs> or were you really spending nah. the time to, to nail it all? I was, no, it was tech, it was the technical was, it was such a pain. I was kind of getting a little tired of it because it was for eight months of like fixing UVs and like oh man texturing hands and like, like re see, trying to reuse textures as much as I could from hand to hand, but then finding out it's like oh I gotta have different blood passes and different hands and then each hand needs blend shapes. It was just so much technical issues. I had, there was a rigger Eric Laguerre. Uh, you actually, oh, jeez. <laughs> I didn't rigged. even think about rigging. <laughs> yeah, it, it took him as long to rig it as, as it took me to model, basically. It, it, like, you indiv finger individually. I, I, I want to I talk to the guy who rigged this in one of the next portfolios, for sure, because the thing that I'm, I'm imagining looking at this thing right now, as you mentioned rigging, is somewhere somebody's getting credit for animating this, right? And... Mm -hmm. and to the outside industry, most people don't know what a rigger is and the complexity of rigging something like this. And so they're looking at the concept, the modeling and the animation. And, and you know, for a few of us, we're noticing the rigging masterpiece that this must have been. Uh, so we'll it, was, it was quite impressive. Like you move one arm and it's like, it also is a chain reaction of multiple arms. And like you move one arm and then all the other arms move simultaneously. Uh, yeah, this, it was this, quite this, impressive what he did. Uh, I, I hope the animator bought him a beer, bought her a beer, um, <laughs> <laughs> flowers, whatever you could do to say thanks for that one, because boy, um, do you have any other work that's not portrait work you want to give us a, some uh, examples of the type of stuff that, so again, just like with Veggie Tales, we can see the range as, a, as an artist you have. Um, is hard yeah. surface something that's difficult for you? Um, I'm trying to find something that you, you're bad at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do, do you? I'm not very good at hard surface. I guess. Well, and that's. I mean, I can do it. Right. But like, yeah. I, I, if you ask me to model a car, I can probably do it. I just, I don't enjoy doing it though. I just, I wasn't told to do it. I'm just like, oh, uh, I just, I'm not passionate about it. Uh, I just get sick of it really quickly, and I'm, I try and finish it soon before it's actually finished. Right. And you that's typically. I mean? I'm, yeah, I, I'm done. Five years ago, seven years ago, that used to be the thing I think that was much more noticeable than it is now. I think now people are, are getting much more successful at doing hard surface and organic. But, you know, seven years ago when it came to Modeler, it's, do you want a guy who can do hard surface? Do you want a guy who can do organic? And uh, you, would you attribute that to just being that passion? Like you said, people that like cars tend to like cars. They, they That's where they spend their time. That's where they, they put their hours in. Um, or is it just is it just there's something about hard surface versus organic that makes one or the other more difficult for a person? Uh, I think it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I think it might be the workflow. Like uh, modeling hard surface, like they're just the workflow is different than organic stuff. So it's like you really try to define yourself to be good at one. Once you start trying to like spread yourself, it's pretty hard to get really good at one of them. You're kind of decent at both. Right. And it sounds like you have so a lot me, of... It's just like... Go ahead. Oh, uh, no, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure what I was gonna say. You got... Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I was just going to ask them, with the work that you're showing here, and with your relationship with Neil, in a question that Vincent has is that, you know, it looks like you have a lot of creative uh, freedom at Oat Studio. Uh, is that something that makes you excited about working with them? Is that you get to have your own voice and you get to contribute quite a bit of your own design to the process? And that's the second part to that is, you know, are you going in as a 3D concept artist straight out the gates? Meaning that, you know, these are your concepts and your ideas and you're evolving them with the director or are you working with the team and working from a concept? Uh, so when I originally got hired, I just assumed that I was just the modeler, like maybe texture artist, but as the time went on, they were like, oh, no, no, like we're 25 people. We're 20, 25 people doing four hours of content. It's like, you're going to do more than just that. So you, <laughs> you're going to do some concept thoughts as well. Uh, Steve Wang, uh, he did a lot of the concepts. Uh, he did the concepts for like uh, this guy, uh, the Firebase guy. 
So I use his concepts to model these guys, but some, something like this. It's like this is one I, I did concepted, and uh, I concepted this guy. So it was, it was kind of new for me. Uh, it was kind of like I was a little worried when Neil first came to me. He's like, I want you to do this. I was like, well, I, I don't really do this. He's like, well, you have no choice. You're going to have to do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's, it's nice to get that level of trust. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I was, it was kind of worrying some at first, but then after a while, like knowing that you have that creative freedom and you have to trust from him, it's, it really is like, I don't know, it's a, it's a good experience. There's a, there's a push when it comes to somebody trusting you like that to actually want to deliver more. And and I also think that, you know, when you put yourself in a situation like that where, you know, it, I, I refer to as, you know, having to take a punch in the gut, right? Like, um, you know, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to jump into it. And, you know, that's your choice. Your choice is to stand and deliver or to run. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like at times that's what pushes people in production forward. There's things in production, there's periods of time where you learn a lot when you first get into the industry. And then there's times where you flatline. And then there's like that second re regeneration. Um, and I think that second regeneration or that second push to get you back out there to, to growing is sometimes being thrown into those situations. Do you feel like that's one thing that's happened to you with Oats? Uh, yeah, it definitely, definitely pushed me. Like, yeah, I don't think I could have done stuff like this before, but yeah, it's definitely pushing me into, into this, which I really appreciate. I think like being pushed to do anything is like, that's, that's the only way to improve. Like if you're just going to remain static, this industry, like the artists coming to this industry, industry now are way better than they were before. And it's like, if you're going to be static, you're going to be left behind within a year. So if you're not constantly improving, you're going to be left in the dust. And do you think that the things that you're doing outside, the things that you're doing with portraiture, like, you know, I'm looking at these setups and it's pretty clear that you've gone in and lighting's playing an important role. The lighting that you're doing in these, is that coming from the portraiture that you're doing outside the studio or were you already lighting your models and presenting your models in this way before that? Oh, like, like these ones, the Zygote? Yeah, yeah, the Zygote and the Rock yeah. imaging. Yeah, I just, this just kind of came from my, like, uh, portraits, I guess. So right. we used to, I'm not sure if I actually have any images of what I had before. Well, I think I, uh... so basically that's what I would do originally to show like the, like this, the model like this. But then I was like, well, if I'm going to be showing these online, I may as well make them kind of cooler looking. Yeah, I, I, I to hate to, to say it, but it's, it's painful to look at that now, right? Like, and not that, not because it's bad, but, you know, if we've just been staring at the screen at something so well lit, and this is a, still a perfectly good model, but how do you go backwards? Now you've got to spend the time lighting things. Like, you've developed a look that has a caliber or a level of execution that people are going to expect from you. So it's it's kind of something exactly. backwards, right? Uh, actually, I, this is something I actually learned in art school like years ago. I, I was actually failing one of my classes, and it doesn't matter. Like I did, did some I did some work I thought was pretty decent. And I don't I don't definitely don't think I should deserve to be failing. But then I just came into class one day. I took one of my old pieces, something I did a few years back. I told them it was new, but what I did is I presented it like nicely i presented on like a plinth i put it in the sunlight i made the presentation look good i got an a on the front even <laughs> though the work part was actually not really, like it was years old it was like all about presentation it doesn't matter if sometimes like it's presentation is almost more important than the actual artwork that's awesome it's, it's great to be able to pick your brain and take a look at the the range that you have and the depth that you have uh so you're pretty excited about what you're doing you're doing the portraiture um, man, I can't tell you how grateful I am for your help with CG Society and with just reaching back time after time. Um, you gave some free crits over, I think, a period of two weeks to about four or five different students that just post online, giving your own time. And uh, that's why I'm doing this. You know, I'm doing CG Society and the classes and things I'm doing because they serve my own purpose as far as art departments and finding artists and filling studio positions and, and putting together teams. But 
it, it it doesn't if it doesn't have any passion, I don't do a good job at it. So you know, I go through every night and look at every submission on CG Society. I'm always looking for talent people. If you're posting on Facebook or if you're posting on Instagram, I'm grabbing people saying, "Man, I'd love to be able to share your work." Uh, I lose two to five friends on Facebook every month, um, probably every week at this point because I share so many other people's art. But that's what my Facebook is for. So, you know, again, finding fellow travelers, finding people that have the same philosophies as me. Like, it doesn't matter if you're the best. Like, you know, we're surrounded by the best on a daily basis. I'm in L.A. I'm in six, nine studios a week. Um, I see beautiful art all day long. And it's not to say that doesn't excite me anymore. But it will say that there's more excitement watching someone go from you know, being inspired and being in a class and being in a school and then seeing that moment of development where they kind of get it, where they go from, you know, doing student work to showing you the potential of who they're going to be one day as an artist. Um, I saw that two years ago, a little over two years ago with um, a great artist that I work with, Ken Faircloud. He teaches some classes and done some work with me. And he's just like this brilliant guy. And like now he's putting out work that, you know, it's the best, right? But it's been exciting for me to see him go through that evolution. So having people like you and Ken and all these guys around that contribute, that donate their time, that give back instead of just putting their own work out. Um, I just want to say thanks from all of us and speak for everyone <laughs> rudely. Um, but thank you so much, Ian. I appreciate it, man. Uh, anything you want to leave people with? Do you want to give your website um, and, and anything that you want to say before we wrap no. this all up or any last Last question from the audience. That's a quick one. Uh, well, if anybody's like, if there's anything I've missed, like anybody can feel free to email me at any time. I try to do my best to respond to as many people as I can. So if anybody's got questions, like, like just email me. It's uh, inspriggs at gmail.com. Wow, that's super cool. Be careful with that, man. Um, <laughs> I'll contact you after this and, and find out if you want to make sure you want to use that or if you want to make up a new Gmail. Um, <laughs> but but uh, there's some other amazing modelers in here today. Um, and you know everybody in the, the audience here, like there's a group that's been kind of following all these webinars that we're doing. And that gets me excited because I want you guys to get to know each other and to be helping each other out as a group because that really works as a class and helps you evolve. Um, Miriam Lee, um, work is great work. Corey, so many of you guys in here. Jose, um, thanks for stopping in. And hopefully you're getting the message of why we're doing this and you get the bug and want to reach back and help other people out as well. Tomorrow we have Christoph Desse. Um, and then I want to give a shout out just uh, for sponsorship, CGMA. Uh, we have Demo Real Workshops that have classes open for the next two or three days with Jason Martin, Ken Fairclough. So check out the website, see if those fit you. Uh, Hannah King has a class in there as well right now. And I think Adam's class is full. So, um, but thank you so much, guys. If you could share these webinars, if you could share the classes, it gives me the time to be able to continue to find cool people like Ian and share a little bit of inside their head with you. So thank you very much, everybody. And that wraps up today. Um, I'll see you around. Ian, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for all the help and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you.